Well, welcome to the College of Complexes. This is our 489th meeting since we started in February 2009. We put a speaker on every week, a different subject. We require a speaker to take a position on an issue or express a point of view that had to be for or against something. We don't care what it is. We give the speaker up to an hour to make a presentation. If they go over an hour, we cut them off. If anybody interrupts the speaker, we remind the interrupter we listen only one fool at a time. One of our roles. Then we have questions and answers from the audience of the speaker, not speeches. Then we have remarks, rebuttals, everybody in this audience that wants to get five minutes at the podium here to respond to the speaker said for or against. Our speaker gets the last word, gets a comment, the comment closes me, that's how it works. But before we pay our speaker, before we put our speaker on, we have time for announcements. Anybody have announcements they want to make? Now's the time to do it. All right, I guess I got one. All right. Uh, Dallas Philosophers Forum is meeting this Tuesday at Boca's Restaurant, um, and the speaker is going to talk about the life of Ivan Ilyich. Um, I think it's a discussion about what is the meaning of life or something on that order. So anyway, if you're interested in philosophy, we welcome you to come. It's $5 uh, to listen to the lecture, and uh, the food's good. So uh, this Tuesday at Boca's Restaurant in Richardson. Any other announcements? Now's the time. Anybody have any announcements they want to make? Time to get out of your system. No announcements? All right. Our, our speaker next week is uh, <coughs> Richard D. Easton. He's going to talk about the history, threats, and future outlook of GPS. It's on your itinerary. I'm not going to read all this. And uh, on February 8th, uh, Jan, Jan Lee is going to be PhD. He's going to talk about uh, on the power of belief, and uh, that ought to be interesting, and that's on your itinerary also. On February 15th, uh, Dale, Chris, Dale Klosterman, he's, he's, he's a uh, ED, retired licensed by psychologist, he's going to talk about is China spreading its control over the entire Pacific Basin? That ought to be interesting. And on February 22nd, uh, Abe Garcia is going to talk about on the importance of creativity. So we have quite a round of speakers coming up. Anyway, it's on your itinerary. I'm not going to read all this, but uh, it's there. Our speaker tonight is uh, Eve Ellsbury. She's going to talk about what is a 14th Amendment U.S. citizen. She's a lawful inhabitant. She'll discuss how a peace, how as peaceful inhabitants we have, we have a we haven't lost control of the United States of America by consent and have entered into a contractual obligation with the United States, Inc., a foreign quasi-government corporation located within the 10 square miles of Washington, D.C. She will contrast the difference between the United States of America and the United States, Inc. The first, a lawful de jure government where all men equally enjoy inalienable rights and the other, a de facto state corporation posing as a government where through legislation, a new corporate person described in the 14th Amendment as the U.S. citizen was created. He will discuss the lawful and legal ramifications of the standing and statute of the 14th Amendment U.S. citizen and conclude that this, this presentation is for informational purposes and not to be legal advice. So without further, further ado, please do a very, very warm welcome to Eve Ellsbury. I'd like to pass out a handout. I'll pass them out for if you want. You can see them and it might be easy, very easy for the people that aren't eating, but it may be easy. Less easy for the people. Oh, it's all, oh everybody. That is one hand. 
That's one. You can have somebody else do that. Do passing out here you go. All right. All right. Yeah. 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 Oh, well, no, we haven't. Okay. We haven't. But, do we need to read this prior to your talk? Yeah, it's really simple. It's super Tested on this? Absolutely. That's good. That's good. Okay. When I was in prison, I was in prison. When I was in prison, I was in prison. When I was in prison, I was in Does anybody understand what I just said? No. In French? <laughs> okay. Okay. I was speaking a foreign language. <clears throat> I'm speaking French. And if you were to walk into a French class, like Alma teaches over there, she teaches Spanish, you would walk into, in the 21st century, you would walk into an immersion class where no English would be spoken. Okay? So the teacher would speak. Only, only English, and you would, you might say, if you're our generation, you might say, well, I don't understand a thing that woman is saying. She's speaking another language, and how am I supposed to understand it? Likewise, tonight, I'm going to be speaking another language. So I invite you to give me your utmost attention, because I. I don't think you may have heard this before. And let me assure you that I am speaking another language, but the words are very similar. They're words that you've heard many times, but I can assure you the meanings are very different. Tonight I'd like to speak about something that's very personal to me. I was a political delegate promoting a platform that, with absolutely no knowledge of what I was talking about or the system that I was participating in. Because the system I was participating in had a whole other agenda. So the question is, how did this happen? Now I'm not talking about the Illuminati, I'm not talking about the white hats, the black hats, the Masons, the Deep State, the Republicans, the Democrats, I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about two jurisdictions. And those are the jurisdictions of the United States, Inc. and the several states of the United States. Has anybody heard this before? No. Okay. I didn't know there were two jurisdictions operating in what we call America. 
So tonight, I would like to explain what these two jurisdictions are. So if you'll turn with me to page one of my handout, we can begin. I didn't know there wasn't a, a, a projector, so I'll just start with page one. Okay, so the, my, my thesis tonight is, are you a U.S. American, are you a United States citizen, and do you want to be one? I'm just asking that question, do you want to be one? Okay, if you'll look with me on page one, and you can see I have the pages labeled on the top and sometimes on the bottom, so it's easy to follow with me. The concepts that I'm going to lay out are really simple, but it's another language. Okay, so what I'm saying, the claim that I'm making tonight is that there are two jurisdictions. Two jurisdictions. On the left-hand side, there's the U.S. citizen who has civil rights. Sounds good, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Okay. On the right side, where you see the civil states of the United States, there are not civil rights, but there are un inalienable rights, or unalienable rights. Can, does that make any sense to most people? Mm -hmm. no. Okay. No? no? One is government granted, the other one is from our creator. Correct. One is government granted, and the other is from our creator. The one on the left is the government has granted it. But let's look and see what government what kind of government is the United States, Inc.? We all know that the United States is a corporation. We scream about it. If we're Democrats, we're very concerned about that. If we're Republicans, we tend to ignore it, right? But one side is, on the left side, is that the citizens are granted their rights, which actually, what I'd like to talk about tonight, are not really rights. They're just benefits and privileges, obligations and duties. On the right-hand side, if you look at the bottom right under the map of the United States, you can see that I said, the citizenry of the United States of America, small u, small s, are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of property. Now, these are all words that we've heard before, right? Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. Many times. Okay. But what my thesis is, again, if you, look, if you read with me at the bottom, is that there were two jurisdictions in operation. Is, is everybody pretty much hanging with me here? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, so if you'll turn with me to page two. What I'm going to do is make the claim that Americans and U.S. citizens are different. Well, what's the difference between a U.S. citizen and an American? I thought they were the same. No. 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 no not, not at all. Not at all. No. Okay. So if you look with me on the left-hand side inside the box, citizens of the U.S. Inc. are not people of a state. They're people of the U.S. Inc., okay? Citizens are not we the people created by the Constitution. And citizens are not, are U.S. citizens. The Constitution doesn't apply to the U.S. citizen. Has anybody heard that before? No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think someone mentioned it last time. Oh, good, okay. So somebody has talked about it before, okay. So if you look on the left-hand side of my handout on page two, you can see that the federal democracy is exclusive, unlimited legislative power over the citizens. The, the Congress has power over the citizens. And I'm gonna explain how Congress got power over the citizens in my little talk here. So if you look at the bottom on the left-hand side, it says U.S. citizens live in Washington, D.C. Hey, John, do you live in Washington, D.C.? Once in a while. <laughs> well. And it depends on which foot I'm leaning. <laughs> well, if you're a U.S. citizen, Congress has said that you are a citizen of Washington, D.C. Wow. That's what Congress says. 
Now, in this talk, I don't want to give a lot of statutes and codes and this and that because it'll just, it's like a fire hose with too much water, right? But I want to give a few. So if you'll bear with me and look to the right hand side of page two of my handout, what the claim I'd like to make is that Americans, not citizens at the top, have inalienable rights to enforce the what is enumerated in the Constitution. Well, I was a school teacher for 15 years. I didn't know what the Constitution said. I thought the 14th Amendment just freed the slaves and it was a good thing. But if you look in this little box, you can see that Americans are, if you look at the box to the right, you can see that Americans are citizens of states and their sovereignty is determined by their proclamation. So when I say I'm an American, it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm a citizen. It means that I am the one that determines what the law is, unless I contract with the US Inc. What I'd like to show tonight is how we contract with the United States Incorporated. So well, that people would say, well, that sounds lawless. It looks like you're just saying you can do whatever you want. No, not really. Because Americans cannot violate the laws of nature and nature's God. So if, you, if you're a good Democrat, you probably know that term. If you're a Republican, you might try to make it, put a religious stamp on it. But what I'm saying is you, you just do with it whatever you want to. The claim that I'm making here, if you look at the bottom of my handout on page two, is that US citizens live by contract, the contracts they've made with the United four. States. The most important one is their birth certificate. And I'm gonna explain that in just a little bit. On the right hand side of my handout on page two, is I'm going to say that Americans live in the 50 continental states and they're not subject to the jurisdiction of Washington DC, which is only 10 square miles, where the Constitution doesn't apply. Okay, if you'll turn with me to page two. Three. Oh, sorry, three. You're right. Okay, what, see, what I'm saying is I'm not ranting against the government. I'm not choosing Republican or Democrat. I'm not saying that we need to get our morals back. I'm not saying any of that. What I'm saying is that the Supreme Court has determined that there are two types of citizens. Okay, so the Supreme Court beginning in 1873 just has determined over 25 times that there are two kinds of citizens. And maybe you've heard of the slaughterhouse cases, have you heard of those? Okay, all right. That substantiation is found in a handout that I can give you, it's 122 pages and I'll have to email it to you. So if you're interested in that, I can email it to you, I'll pass it around if you're interested. I'm on page three. Okay. All right. So if you look on the left hand side of my handout, the little picture of the Washington, D.C. and the 10 square miles right there. Well, actually, it took some of the 10 square miles off, but that's another subject. The U.S. citizen lives in Washington, D.C., and it's called a federal district. On the right hand side, an American lives in one of the several states. For example, if you live in Texas, you're called a Texan. If you live in Virginia, you're called a Virginian, etc., etc. Okay, if you'll go with me to page four. Okay, so to understand more fully what a U.S. citizen is, we have to ask the question, what is the United States? I'm not asking what is the United States of America. I'm asking what is the United States incorporated? located in the 10 square miles of Washington, D.C. What is it? It's a corporation. Now, we kind of already know it's a corporation. I mean, 
a lot of us are screaming about that, right? I mean, we're pretty upset about that. But we don't know how we're subject to it. Okay. One example that I'd like to give you is that if you look at the bottom of my handout, it shows a Washington, D.C. license plate. Has anybody ever lived in Washington, D.C.? No? Close. Close. Okay. Well, have you ever seen a license plate for Washington, D.C.? No. Yes, you did, John? Okay. It tells you, hidden in plain view, that people who live in Washington, D.C. have taxation without representation. Why? Why? Has anybody ever thought about why? They have no representatives. They have no representatives in Washington. Why do they have no representatives in Washington? It's a federal territory. In a federal territory, are there rights? No. No, there are no rights. Okay. So if you'll hang with me here, the claim I'm making is that if if you and I have a birth certificate, we are a resident of the 10 square miles of Washington, D.C. So I'm just going to throw this out. Does that mean our vote counts? Not necessarily. It means no? Yeah. If we're a citizen of the U.S. Inc., our vote doesn't count. Okay. So another thing, you know, I, I, I was not a student of history, so I really didn't understand what the territories were. Is everybody familiar with the territories, Guam, Marian Islands? Yes. Okay. It, could somebody tell me what, what a territory means? It's governed by the federal government. And no state. And no state. It's governed by the federal government and no state. Do the people have rights in the territories? If the federal government gives it to them. If the federal government gives it to them. Yeah. Okay. So basically, they have some privileges and some obligations, but they don't really have rights. They don't have inalienable rights. They can't scream constitution because they only have what the federal government gives to them. So that's good. Okay. So page four. Let's go to page five. Yeah. So in 1901, the Supreme Court decided that the Constitution has no application on the territories, AKA Washington, D.C. And Congress has a power wholly unrestricted by it. So that means Congress can do whatever they want. So why are we protesting? Why are we voting? If we're citizens of the United States? <coughs> it's been hidden from us. It's been hidden from us. It's been hidden from us. So the 1898 Treaty of Peace, which is the treaty that was able to abscond Puerto Rico, said the civil rights and the political status the citizenship of the native inhabitants shall be determined by the Congress. So the civil rights are determined only by Congress. So what does that mean? There are no rights. Because they could change their mind. Okay, next page. <laughs> it's going to get a little bit, I'm just trying to lay a foundation. Okay. Because a lot of people haven't heard this. A lot of people haven't heard it, so it's kind of hard to differentiate between the two. When I first heard it, I really couldn't believe it. Because I was fighting for my rights. I was protesting. I was going hanging banners off of freeways. I was doing this and that, trying to get people out of prison, all kinds of things. Trying to elect the right person. I didn't understand this. So what I'd like to say on page six, if you're with me, is that there are distinctions between the America and the United States. 
There are separate distinctions, and the two never meet. So Washington, D.C. is a territory, right? So there are no rights in Washington, D.C. And according to the Supreme Court, who made a decision in 1901 and many other times, 24 other times to, to document, probably more than that, but I can send you the 24 times if you'd like, have determined that the Constitution does not apply for the U.S. citizen. On the right hand of my handout, on page six, it states that America is a landmass of states and it's not territories. So what does that mean? It means that people in America have rights. Do we have rights if we're U.S. citizens? No. No. But how do we get to be U.S. citizens? And this is the question that I'm going to ask at the end of this. So if you'll turn with me to page seven. The United States and America have separate jurisdictions. If you look with me on the left hand side, the United States Inc. is a corporate governing body and it is sovereign. So it has the right to tell us what to do regardless of the Constitution. If you're looking on the left hand side of page seven. <clears throat> Why? Because because Washington, D.C. is a democracy. There's a big difference between a democracy and a republic. Although I didn't ever knew the difference. I just used the terms interchangeably. I didn't know. I was a good public school teacher for lots of years. I just thought, you know, we had to keep those Arabs out of our country or the, the Mexicans out. I didn't know. Okay, so if you look at me, with me on the right hand side, <clears throat> in the United States of America, the Constitution and common law is enforceable for the sovereign. Can somebody tell me who the sovereign is? And I'm not talking about a sovereign citizen, I'm talking about the sovereign. The one who decides what happens and who is the law. Who, de who decides what happens and is the law? Who? Not in the United States of America. Who said that? Is it? Who did? I did. Where, where are you? Calvin. Calvin. Oh, okay. Okay, so Calvin, I don't know you, but hi. Okay, so you said that Congress and the President make determine what the law is. Not in the United States of America, where the Constitution applies. If you're with me on page seven. Now, I was taught that too because I'm a good public school teacher, good Christian, went to church, a whole bit. Okay, so who determines what the law is? Well, the people, theoretically. No, and the Supreme Court decides in the in the 10 square miles of Washington, D.C., and nowhere else, according to the 14th Amendment. The, the, not, not only the individual state, but the, the individual decides because his decisions are based on the Constitution. Okay, that's a bigger topic than what you know, what we need to go into right now. Anyway, you'll turn with me to page eight. <clears throat> now, I'm almost through all of this, but this is just laying a foundation if you've never heard of this before. <clears throat> On page eight, there are evidences that citizenships, with plural citizenships, are distinct from one another. Okay, now, if you'll track with me and look on the left-hand side, it says the District of Columbia is a corporation created in 1871. Would anyone rebut that? I found it once. <laughs> okay, so let me say it again. The District of Columbia is a corporation. It's not a state, right? 
and it was created in 1871. Does anybody know who created the Washington, D.C.? Congress. Yeah. Congress. Congress created it, okay? It was land mass also. Well, I'm going to explain that in just a minute. About the land mass. Okay, so it's citizens, the citizens of the 10 square miles of Washington, D.C., are called U.S. citizens per the 14th Amendment. It's the first time that the word U.S. citizen is used is in the 14th Amendment. So if you're concerned about the 14th Amendment, the 14th Amendment has, is what it has enslaved us, not with involuntary servitude, but voluntary servitude because we agreed to be slaves. But the 14th Amendment, on the other hand, has the remedy because you don't have to participate. But I'm going to explain that in a minute. So the 14th Amendment has the problem and the 14th Amendment has the answer. So if you'll look with me on the right-hand side of page 8, it says, the Constitutional Republic is described by the land mass of the 50 states. The citizens of the United States of America, not the United States, Inc., are born in one of the 50 states, and they have not entered into a contract with the District of Columbia by their birth certificate, and I'm going to explain the birth certificate in a minute. They are sovereign and peaceable inhabitants of the land. They're not protesting Obamacare. They're not protesting Trump. Immigration. Why? Because when someone puts their foot on this land, they are what the Supreme Court has called a lawful inhabitant. Okay, if you'll go with me to page 9. Okay, on page 9, you can see a picture of your driver's license, a picture of your social security number. If you, and you don't need to do this, but if you flip back to page 8, the Supreme Court has determined that the citizens of the United States are identified by all capital letters. What does that mean? Well, if you take out a picture of your driver's license, which you could do right now if you want to, but I'm giving you an example here, it's written in all caps. Well, that term is called capital Diminutio. Has anybody ever heard of that before? No. 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 Okay. Maybe I'm saying something somebody hasn't heard before. But what that says is that when your name is written in all caps, you are that of no more than a slave. Now, that's hard to believe, but I have hundreds of pages of substantiation for this. Also, I'll give you another definition in the U.S. Legal Dictionary that says capitus dimin diminutio literally means the diminishing of one's personality or status. A person may lose his personality or legal capacity either in whole or in part. Okay. So, yeah, so take out your, some people are taking out their driver's license. Yeah, I'm curious. Yeah, I'm curious. All capitals. All capitals. Yes. When you get sued, you're in all capitals. When you go to a district court, it's all capitals. Oh, wow. When you get a utility bill, it's in all capitals. I can explain that later, but that's a whole other topic. But if you ever get a letter in all capitals, there's a remedy for that. You can write on the letter, wrong addressee, and send it back. Because wow. it's not you. It's somebody that they created. Now, I'm not going to talk about that tonight. That's called the straw man. If you've never heard of that before, it's a very interesting topic. <laughs> so, okay. So, I'm on page 10. If you look at me, if you look with me on the left-hand side, I'm just going to restate it. The U.S. citizen, the United States citizen, has no rights. But he does have benefits and privileges enumerated by the 14th Amendment. Now, we're going to talk about the 14th Amendment in a minute. Can anybody tell me 
what kind of privileges that you have as a U.S. citizen? Oh, right to vote. That's a privilege. It, is it a right or a privilege? It should be a it's right. A privilege. It should be, according to the Constitution, a right. It's a privilege. Right. But it was changed through the 14th Amendment to be a privilege. Yes. Equal rights clause of the 14th Amendment. Yes, but it's not exactly called the Equal Rights Clause. It's called the, the um, ah, that's slipped my mind right now, but the enumera enumeration clause. Okay. Can anybody tell me what the duties of the U.S. citizen are? Well, to uphold the Constitution is one of them. Oh, I haven't heard that. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to find some substantiation on that. Yeah. Into that. <laughs> okay. Anybody know another duty of the U.S. citizen? Pay tax. Pay tax. Oh, yeah. That's your duty. That's called compelled performance. Anybody a lawyer in here? I know you're a lawyer. Yes. Okay. Would you explain to the congregation, congregation would you explain to the audience what, a, what compelled performance is? If you don't do it, you can... Uh eventually you can go to jail. Now how could that be? If you don't pay your taxes, you eventually go to jail. Yes, John? Well, I'm going to uh, rebut on that because the entire tax code tells you at all points it is voluntary. It is voluntary. Now why would that be? Now, we, John and I know about Sherry Peel Jackson. She went to prison because she didn't want to pay her taxes. Well, she was an IRS agent. Too. And she was an IRS agent. So how could that be? I thought taxes were voluntary. They are voluntary. No? No, they are voluntary. They are not voluntary. I mean, they are voluntary. But you made a contract. Does anybody know what that contract was? Sh Sherry Peel Jackson. It was her birth certificate. Her birth certificate said she was a U.S. citizen. And because she's a U.S. citizen, she is compelled to perform on the taxes. So she has a choice either to be a U.S. citizen or not a U.S. citizen. Unfortunately, she didn't know that. She hired a lawyer. Her chances of not going to prison were about 3%, and she went to prison for five or six years. So, and, and mo many of you are familiar with her. So... Um, she didn't go because it's an unjust system. It's a perfectly just system. But she became a citizen when she didn't object to her birth certificate and her voter registration, which I'm going to get into in a minute. <laughs> okay. All right. So on page 10, I just laid it out again. I'm now repeating myself, repeating myself. But these are concepts I didn't understand. So when I hear people talking about it, I was like, Wait a minute, I don't understand the difference between the two. Why am I being compelled to perform? Okay, so the next page. Just one more distinction between the U.S. and the several states. I'm on page 11. The U.S. Incorporated is not a state, and it's not under the, under the Constitution, and it's a corporation. Well, let me say this. Who owns the United States? Anybody know? Oh, that's a good question. No? No. No, it's a private corporation. Yes. No, no. Bag <laughs> I, I said tonight I wasn't going to go into the Illuminati, the Vatican, the this, the that. But it's a question. So if we don't know who we made a contract with, is it still valid? No. Yes. No. It's still valid until we rebut it. Oh, wow. It still holds until we say no. And I'm going to, I'm going to um, okay. disagree with that there, but okay. we can address that later. Yeah, uh, but let me finish my presentation and then you can, then you can ask me questions as, as, it, as it's supposed to go here. Okay. So I'm on page 11. I'm on the left-hand side. I just said that D.C. is a corporation. Pretty much everybody would agree with me about that. On the right-hand side, I said that the several states are united under the Constitution. Now, I don't have time to go into what the Constitution says other than life, liberty, and the pursuit of, ha a pursuit of property. 
that's a that's more than even more than we can talk about tonight. Okay, next page. Page twelve. Okay, the United States on page twelve and America have separate systems of law. Okay, what's the difference between a jurisdiction and a system of law? Say that again? State versus federal. State versus federal? Federal? Yes and no. I'll, and I'll explain. Well, no. Pardon? Not quite. Okay. Well, there's lots of different types of laws, and I'm going to address just three, but there's many more types of laws. But tonight, for our purposes, I'm just going to address three. Okay. So in Washington, D.C., Washington operates under something called the color of law. Anybody heard of the color of law? Mm -hmm. Who said uh-huh? Okay. Could you explain it? Well, it sounds like what the law says, so we're going to do it this way. But is it the law? Not necessarily. And how is it backed? Well, it's backed by guns and by, police and military guns. and such things like that. Okay. So, it's, so Cong what Congress can do is they can pass legislation and they can enforce codes Statutes, what else? Codes and statutes. Procedure. Procedure. So, after 1871, well, actually, after 18, after 18, after 1933, all law in in the U.S. Inc. became civil procedure. So basically, the law disappeared. That was Roosevelt. Exactly. Yes. So that was the New Deal. So on the right hand side of page 12, America operates under common law, which is based in natural law, which must have an injured party. Can anybody explain to me injured party? Somebody actually has to get hurt. Somebody actually has to get hurt. Oh, wow. Okay, so what about if you want to run a stop sign? Did somebody get hurt? No. No. What if you didn't pay your taxes? Did somebody get hurt? No. But federal actors have actually said that they will tell you, I am telling you the state is an injured party. The state is an injured party. Okay. Now, if you look on page 12, what I'm saying is that an American is not part of the U.S. state, the a state of the United States. So, when you run a stop sign as an American, do, can you get prosecuted? No. Because an American doesn't have an all-caps driver's license. I'm, I'm, getting off the, I'm getting off the track a little bit, but let's go to what some people might call an illegal alien. Do you know what the proper term for an illegal alien is? Anybody know? And this is the Supreme Court, and I have it in my notes here. It's called a lawful resident. Oh. If somebody comes to this country and puts their foot on the ground, they're not illegal. Remember back in 2004 when all the Democrats were screaming, there's no such thing as an illegal alien? Do you remember that? No? They were. But there is no such thing as an illegal alien. Because aliens are only lawful until they contract with the United States Inc. So they get a driver's license, matric matriculation, green card, whatever. So that's why supposed illegal aliens are such a supposed threat, is because they are actually lawful Americans. Oh, wow. Yeah. They don't pay taxes. They can go to Bank of America and open up a uh, they can open up a checking account with no social security card, right. and we have to give our social security card. What if we don't pay our taxes and we have a bank account? They, they shut they down our tax. Uh, they bank account. They shut down our bank account. Does that sound fair? No. <laughs> no. Okay. Page thirteen. Okay. So the United States Inc. operates. On the left hand side, in a legal world. 
So the and the and the United States of America on the right hand side of page thirteen operates in a lawful world. So what I what I'm trying to show is the difference between legal and lawful here on page thirteen, if you're with me. So the first example, number one, like growing hemp might be legal. And it might be illegal, depending on what the a state says. On the right hand side, growing hemp would be always lawful because it's part of life, liberty, and the pursuit of property. Do what you want with your land. It doesn't harm anyone. Doesn't harm anyone. Number two, murder. On the legal side, you could say some states say abortion is murder, some states don't. Whatever the state says it is, it is. But on the on the republic side, on the right hand side, murder would always be unlawful. That includes murder for war, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, number three, stealing might be legal through taxation without representation. Well, in the U.S. Inc. side, the United States side, taxation without representation. It's how it is. They just take your money, and we cannot object according to the 14th Amendment. On the right-hand side, tax on our labor, according to the Constitution, is always unlawful. On the fourth one, is civil asset forfeiture might be considered legal. And when, if anybody remembers when Trump first got into office, did anybody see that? No? When, when Trump first got into office, he, his first executive order. His first executive order was what? Civil asset forfeiture for Civ those involved in harming people. Yes. So he, when he reinstated civil asset forfeiture because it was illegal in Texas, and he turned it back into the police can take your stuff before you're ever prosecuted. Unfortunately, and that, there was an executive order on that. Okay, so next page. Now I'd like to address the birth certificate. How many people in here know that the birth certificate is what makes you a citizen? Did you just raise your hand? Did you know that? Okay, so what I'd like to share is, Brittany knows it because I share it with her all the time. <laughs> Um, what I'd like to share tonight is that the birth certificate doesn't make you a citizen. Not rebutting the birth certificate is what makes you a citizen. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. The birth certificate is not what makes you a citizen. Not objecting to the birth certificate is what makes you a citizen. Okay. Let me give you just a quick scenario. I couldn't do that when I was three. You yeah. couldn't do that when you were three, but your mother could. Oh. She's the one that ratted on you. In fact, she's called the informant in the birth certificate process. Oh my gosh. Look it up. <laughs> okay. So the birth certificate, when our mother didn't object, then... Um, what is an unrebutted law? Like the lawyer back here. Tell me your name again. Albert. 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 I know you. Yeah. Okay. So if you don't rebut an accusation, what what happens to that accusation? Well, it tends to stand. It stands as law, right? Yeah. yeah. However, it, it, that still violates contract law. It, it does violate contract law, but you have to object. Fundamental right? common co uh, contract law, because a contract is not valid unless there's a meeting of the minds. Correct. And right. so that on the birth certificate, 99.10 million <laughs> percentage of the people don't know. Right, but if they don't object, does it still stand? Well, according to the crooks, it does, but it shouldn't. It shouldn't, but it does, right? So, so when we didn't object to our birth certificate, that's what made us a U.S. citizen. So just to review again one more time, what is a U.S. citizen? He is a person who is identified by capitus diminutio. 
by all caps name. Can you define person? Yes, I'll define person in just a minute. Uh, he's defined by his, his legal name is in all caps. It means he has no rights. He can scream and holler, they can let you have stuff on TV about whatever president they want you to have. But you're not, your vote is going to Washington, D.C. In Washington, D.C., it doesn't matter. There is no representation. Well, I'm asking, I'm not saying don't vote, I'm just asking why. If you're a U.S. citizen. Now, there's a way to lawfully vote, but that's a whole other story. Okay, so how do we become citizens? The first one, number one on page 14. We became citizens because we did not object to the registration of our birth certificate. Number two, the U.S. citizen is a registered voter. When we register to vote, Republican or Democrat, we told the voter registration people in Austin that we are a U.S. citizen. They didn't tell us. We told them. They never tell us we're a U.S. citizen because we're doing it by contract. You say by volunteering in? By, by volunteering? But, well, it's not exactly by volunteering. It's by contractual agreement that isn't rebutted. Yeah. Okay. So number four, and number three on page 14, the U.S. citizen is a taxpayer who cannot question the public debt for the 14th Amendment. Now there's a clause in the 14th Amendment, it's section four, and it says, the citizen shall not object to the public debt. When we're talking about all these civil rights, why don't they ever mention that? I was a school teacher, I never heard of that. I never heard that I as a citizen couldn't object to the public debt. So that means I can't object to the war, I can't object to abortion, I can't object to anything that I might feel is right or wrong. Yes? If you object, how can you be stopped from objecting to the public debt? How can you, say that again? How can you be stopped from, do you want to you object to the public debt? Because you don't have any standing. Well, what if you do it through your representatives? If you do it through your representatives, you have none because you're a citizen of the, of the United States, of America, of the United States, Inc. Okay, well, if you're wondering why things aren't working and you're concerned about the political climate and who's getting in office and this and that, these things are important because you can object all day. Maybe you need to remind them you're speaking a foreign language. Yes, I'm speaking a foreign language. I'm using words that you know, but I'm speaking a foreign language. It was foreign to me. When I first heard this, one of my clients gave me a CD, uh, a DVD before YouTube, and I went home and watched it, and I could not sleep. I was so disturbed by it. I went back to him and I go, this can't be true. And of course I didn't understand that about 10% of it. And he just looked at me and he said, it's true. Wow. Yes? In law, words often have definitions unknown to the public. That's right, legalese. Federal arts. It's witchcraft, really, isn't it? Uh, it's criminal, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, in the United States, Inc., there are no criminal laws, and I'm going to show that in the next. You can, they can say it's criminal all day long, but there are no criminal laws. So but there are no criminal laws, but there could be a criminal attorney. There is a criminal penalty, but there are no criminal, there are no criminal courts. All the courts are commercial. Okay, next page. Okay, this is the most difficult page to grasp, but this is the crux of it. Okay, so in 1893, the Supreme Court recognized Erie versus Tompkins. A lot of people in this room may be familiar with that case, but what that did was it merged three types of law, and Albert, I think you would, you would agree with me here. Maybe, maybe not. So the three types of law that existed were, were legislative decisions that was created through the 14th Amendment, equity, and let me explain just briefly what equity is, if somebody could explain it for me, anybody? You want to try? I'm not going to try. It's very simple. Equity 
is the is the jurisdiction of compelled performance. Okay, for example, it's just contract law. That's all it is. So if I agree to give you ten dollars for those potatoes, and you give me the potatoes, and I don't give you the ten dollars, what can I do? I can compel you through the courts to pay me, right? Okay, if I say I'm a citizen and the IRS says you owe me this and that, they can compel you. Your, your, your freedom is gone. That's contract law and that usurps any other law because you have a private contract. Now the third thing in the courts today is admiralty law. They never admit it's admiralty law. They always say it's legislative, right? Okay, so, but legislative law is compelled performance, contractual law with a criminal penalty. For example, if you don't pay your taxes, you go to prison. If you run a stop sign, you could go to prison. If you smoke marijuana, you go to prison. And I, I can't think of any other examples, but they're, they're crimes without um, injury. injury, without a victim. Did you explain admiralty law yet? I, I didn't explain it because it's the law of the seas and it would take me about 10 minutes and I think I'd lose everybody. Probably but you know. it's a type, it is it is unconstitutional, let's put it that way. Huh? It deals with a civilly dead entity and that's the U.S. citizen admiralty law. I, I could talk about it, but it'll take me a little bit too long to talk about it. Yes? Now, there are those who debate and say that Erie versus Tompkins actually unfolded the common law into the uh, equity admiralty. It did. It did. It mixed the common law. However, if you look at the bottom of my handout on page 14, look at the very bottom on the left-hand side. Okay, John is saying that they also mixed the common law, which is constitutional law, right? So you should have constitutional remedy. But if you look at that little bullet point on the left-hand side of my handout on page 14, it says, today all courts are owned by the, all, all, all courts are owned by the Federal District of Columbia. So all of our courts are district courts now owned by the United States, Inc. So what's going on in those courts? They cannot have a common law court in it. They have to get another venue. And they do that sometimes. When you hear about a grand jury, you heard on the news, they're gonna have a grand jury, they have to take it out of the district courts. And they have to have that court somewhere else. It's very hard to execute that, but it can be done. Because only in a common law court can you have justice. Because in a commercial court, you only have settlement and discharge because they're, they're commercial. Now that, I'm really speaking another language, but that is the reason why there, we have no justice anymore. There is no justice because we only have a department of justice. Their job is not to bring justice. It's a department of the Federal Reserve. Okay, so if you look on the right-hand side, on page 14, in the United States of America, we are supposed to have natural law and common law. There's two types of common law. Does anybody know the two types of common law? Okay. The first type of common law was English common law. And who was the sovereign in English common law? King. The king. Right. In American common law, who's the sovereign? The president. No. No. The people. Oh, the people. The free inhabitants of the land are the sovereign. But yeah. then why do we have the law of the commoners? Why do we have the law of the commoners? The common law was for the commoners in England. Well, because American common law and English common law are very different. Because the English common law, the king was the sovereign. He determined what the law was. And in the United States, we determine what the common law is based on natural law. Natural law is if you hold this pin up and you drop it, it's gonna to fall to the ground. If you kill somebody, there's recourse. If you steal from them, it's very simple. And the common law is not written. There's nothing written in the common law because 
it's just about what's right and wrong. Okay, so if you look on the right hand side of page 14, it says today common law courts still exist, but they have to be invoked. So you have to move your courtroom into another house. You cannot use a district court. You have to go to a hotel and they'll, they'll do that. So if you, I, I know that almost everybody in here has probably heard of the yellow French flag and the, and the regular flag. You better explain it. Okay. Yeah. Anybody, has anybody not heard of the yellow French flag? No. Oh, you haven't? Okay. All right, if you notice, every time there's a presidential speech, doesn't matter who it is, they're going to have behind him a yellow French flag. Now, I'm not saying this. This isn't any Illuminati stuff or anything. Yellow French flag or American flag? Yellow, yellow fringed French. Oh, French. Yellow French. Uh -huh. yellow the gold French. French. Oh, okay. Oh, different. I heard you say French. Same here. Yeah. Yeah, I, I probably should have stuck this in my presentation. I don't want to get too long. Okay, the yellow French flag is a symbol of military occupation. So anytime you have a district court, any kind of presidential <laughs> proceedings, anything having to do with Washington, D.C., you're going to see the yellow French flag in a school, hospital, whatever. Yes? Except there have been several notable times when Trump went out there without the yellow French flag when he was doing something about the state of the republic. Okay, that's a good point. And he, the thing is, is that he, he may have done that, but the, but the situation is is that there's not a person in this room, there's no one in this in this in this restaurant who live in the republic, because 99% of us are either naturalized or have birth certificates. So he can talk about the republic all day, but we're not party to it. I remember that. <laughs> okay, that's okay. That would be a good question. Okay. All right. So I'd like to go to the next page. Page 15. Okay, these are just a few ideas to think about. Uh, one I just said, there are no criminal courts, only administrative tribunals that issue criminal penalties. That's a topic for another day, but it's something to think about. Okay, the second point on page 15, the second bullet point, is that there are more people in U.S. prisons for victimless crimes than anywhere else in the world. Yep. Why? We all know this, and we're all screaming about how terrible it is, but we don't understand why. So it's something to think about. Because we have idiots that pass laws that said that they'd be put in Yeah, that, that's exactly right. We have idiots that pass laws, but actually a bond is created called the prison bond and performance bond, and actually money is made every time somebody's sent to prison. Yes. That's what private, we allow for private prisons. We allow for private prisons. Yes. Another big mistake. But the, the big question is, is that they're prosecuted in district courts. So, okay. That belong to the United States, Inc. Okay. So the last bullet point is that the U.S. Uh, citizens are required by compelled to performance to go to war. Now they pay us because there is no money. That's a whole nother topic. We're compelled to pay the IRS and we're taxed without representation. And we're, we have compulsory education where we're made to go to school. We're compelled to perform. Okay, next page. This is the crux of it. How did it happen? And this is the 14th Amendment. And a lot of people are concerned about the 14th Amendment, but very few people have really read it other than what they've gotten on CNN or Fox or whatever their television choice is. And so I'm not going to bring up the whole 14th Amendment because everybody's eyes would glass over. But I'm just going to hit a couple of, of points about the 14th Amendment. Okay. Which I'll write on the outset, maybe you can respond to this. Is okay. This is the creation of dual citizenship right there. I can be a state, I can be um, a sovereign of a state, okay. and I can be in this. Or you right there? It just says it right there. Well, actually, there's an axiom that says public and private do not mix. So you can't mix public and private. But that's a whole other topic, and we can, we're going to address that, OK? All right. I don't, I'm not dismissing it. I'm just saying. Okay. So, so section one of the con of the Fourteenth Amendment says all persons born or naturalized in the United States 
and subject to the jurisdiction. Okay, you can see my little arrow on the left-hand side. What jurisdiction are they talking about? Because the, the 50 states, I mean the several states, can be expanded. That's a landmass. The jurisdiction that they're talking about is the 10 square miles of Washington, D.C. It's cryptic, cryptic language. Yeah. Then it says, the first time ever anybody was called a citizen of the United States is in the 14th Amendment. No one was called a citizen of the United States before that. They were a citizen of their state. They were a Virginian, a Texan, whatever. So never before were lawful inhabitants of the continental United States called citizens of the United States. And then the last one, on the right-hand side of page 16, is the citizen of, of the state never went away. We just agreed to give up our birthright by our voter registration, by our social security, by our birth certificate, and many other contracts that we made. 1040. Yeah, 1040. When we signed a 1040 under penalty of perjury, we say I'm a U.S. citizen, therefore I'm subject to pending income tax under compulsion. Gone is my voluntary right to pay or not to pay. Okay, so the last, um, we're getting close to the end, but why are, on page 17, why are citizens of the U.S. made enemies of the state? Is, it, is anyone aware of the 1933 Act for the Enemies of the State? Trading with the Enemies Trading Act. Trading with the Enemies Act. Anybody heard about it? Mm -hmm. No? Okay. The Trading with the Enemies Act was something that was implemented in, in World War I when they had to stop the enemy combatants that might have been on this soil, right? But when they took the gold in 1933, they were so afraid that the citizens would revolt that the Trading with the Enemies Act was amended. Anybody can tell me what amended means? Changed. Changed. Right. Or added to. Right. So it was changed and added to, and it became the U.S. citizen of Washington, D.C., who became the enemy of the state. So the IRS, the federal government, Obama, Trump, whoever, we are considered an enemy of the state. Now, there is an answer though. There's good news, okay? Now, if, I'm not gonna read all this on page 17, but what happened, one of Trump's, I'm not anti-Trump, Obama, Trump, it doesn't matter, but it's applicable to us right now, is that Trump, he renewed the state of emergency and did executive order 13814 in order to continue our relationship with the federal government, the federal United States and Washington, D.C. as enemies of the state. Yes? But why did he do that? He did that for executive orders. He did that by executive order. He needed a state of war to continue the executive orders, right? Right. So they continued the state of war, and they continued the executive order, because in a in state of war, the Constitution is suspended. But it doesn't even have to be suspended, because we've already made a contract through our birth certificate, voter registration, etc., that we have no rights. And even if we have no rights, now we're an enemy of the state. But of course, it's kept very quiet. They're not going to let you know that until they're, they're ready to pounce on you. Okay, so on the next page, page 18, are just more details. You can look these up. There are a lot of statutes and codes about House Joint Resolution 192. Anybody familiar with that? No? Okay, very quickly, House Joint Re Resolution 192 was the abrogation of the Gold Clause. Can anybody explain that to me, what happened in 1933 when they took the gold? Pardon? May 1st. May 1st, May Day. Yeah. What happened? It was illegal on gold. Pardon? Citizens lost the right. Citizens lost the right. What kind of citizens? Not American citizens, but U.S. citizens lost the right to own gold. Okay? 
So they, what did the American citizens do? They gladly gave their gold over to the Federal Reserve. They didn't give it to the government, they gave it to the Federal Reserve. So, and what did they replace that gold with? Notes. Okay. If it's a note, who owes who? Whoever printed the note. The, uh, the, the corporation does, right? Yeah. Pardon? The bank owes the note the holder. Bank. The, the bank owns the holder. Who's the holder? The, the Washington Incorporated? No. All of us suckers. All of us. Oh, oh, gosh. All of us are the holder. Is that why? Yeah, so they owe us. But what do we hear on the media? Who's in debt? Who do they tell us is in debt? We are. We are. Right. Is that true? Yes. No. no. We're the creditor. Oh my God. They took our gold and they promised to pay us back. If you hold up a dollar bill, it says Federal Reserve note. That's they owe us. We don't owe them. But just because they say that we owe them or they make an assumption that we owe them, does it mean we owe them? You're using their debt instrument. There is an argument you do owe because you're dealing with their debt instrument. You contracted with it. That that's a whole other topic, but that, that's a good point. Okay. Now, the, they don't give us another choice. They don't give us another choice. So, a compelled performance in the in the republic is unlawful. Compelled performance for the U.S. citizen, you don't have another choice. So we could trade in gold. I mean, I've heard of people buying cars with gold, houses with gold. You can buy, you can you still use gold. So, okay, so on page 18, those are just some things for you to look at. It's too hard to get into House Joint 192 because it's a big topic. Okay, on page 19. This is the 14th Amendment, and this is probably the most important thing I'm gonna talk about tonight. Especially if you were under the impression that the 14th Amendment freed the slaves. It didn't free the slaves. It created a new person who a new was form of slavery. a new form of slavery. Does anybody know what kind of slavery it, it created? Voluntary. Voluntary slavery. We volunteered through the 14th Amendment. So I'd like to read the 14th Amendment to you, Section 4. Am I running out of time? Five minutes. Okay. Section 4 says the validity of the public debt of the United States, authorized by law, the color of law, shall not be questioned, including debts incurred for payments of pensions and bounties for services in suppressing insurrection or rebellion shall not be questioned. Who is the insurrectionist? We are, according to the U.S. Inc. Okay. Yeah, okay, well... The Senate Report 93 through 549 on page, four, um, page 19 of my handout. You can go and read it. Just Google it. Okay, I'm not just making wild claims. Since March 9, 1933, the United States has been in a state of declared national emergency. Under the powers delegated by these statutes, the President may seize property, organize and control means of production, seize commodities, assign military forces abroad, institute martial law, seize and control all transportation, yada, 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 March 9th, 1933. And so why are we worried about electing a new president? Okay, this is the last, I'm gonna set it. What I've talked about tonight is the difference between involuntary servitude, which the 13th Amendment did away with, but the 14th Amendment implied that we could volunteer. Okay, next page, 22. It just addresses, on page 22, it just addresses the section 4 of the 14th Amendment. If you've never read that before, I'd encourage you to read it because it's amazing that we cannot object. People go out and they protest abortion every day, every weekend, and they go back to work and they're going to pay it with, out of their federal income tax. But they let them object, just as long as they don't go too far. Okay, so the 14th Amendment is enforced by Congress. I'm just gonna skip over page 23 and 24, because we're running out of time, and 25, and I wanna get to page 26. 
So if you'll turn with me to page 26. This is a review of everything that I've talked about tonight. And basically, it's just a recap of the who, what, when, and where. And you can look at this at home if you want to. But the last page that I'd like to discuss is page 27. And it's that the 13th Amendment declared, the 13th and 14th Amendment declared that we don't have to participate. We can resign. Is that being an American? That's part of our right to resign. We can resign from the United States, Inc. And how do we do that? So in the last part of my handout on page 28, I'd like to show you a couple of ways that you can revocate lawfully. One is you can revocate for being a voter. Page 28, they'll send you back acknowledgement that you revocated as a voter. Okay? The next page, page 29, is the IRS. You can, there's a lawful revocation of election. Lawful. They don't tell you about it. You might want to Google this if you have any interest. You can revocate. They'll send you back a letter that says, thank you for your revocation, because it's provided by Congress. Congress provides it for the citizens of the United States, Inc. Because slavery was done away with in the 13th Amendment. So they have to give you an out. Then the last one is the details about the revocation of election as provided by the US Congress. So I'd like to encourage you to think about these things. And if, um, if you have any questions, I'm here. And I hope I didn't go too far over. I meant to bring my timer. <laughs> wow. Okay, that's a lot of time. Oh, it's questions. Okay. So if you revoke your uh, voter registration, that means you can't vote anymore, right? That means you can't vote anymore. Correct. Okay. Well, let me ask you, who are you voting for? Well, somebody I'd rather be in there than somebody else. Okay, but let's see. Okay, so we determined that the Supreme Court has said that citizens are citizens of the 10 square miles of Washington, D.C. <clears throat> Does Washington, D.C. have any any um, representation? No, but I do claim citizenship in the state of Texas. Okay, how did you do that? I live here. Okay, there's an axiom in law, and I know that Albert knows this axiom, that public and private do not mix. You can't mix the republic with the with the um, with the corporation. Okay, but they're antithetical to one another. But trying to deal with this for the average citizen <coughs> is exceedingly difficult. You're correct. And uh, so, so my thing is, I mean, I'm fighting the IRS. And I'm going okay. so far. Okay. Which is good. Um, but. For the average person to pick this up and try to deal with it, um, that's a pretty tough stick to deal it with. It is, it is. But is learning French or learning Spanish difficult? Yeah. Ask Alma. She teaches it every day. Uh-huh. Okay, I'm going to uh, take the position that I want you to review here, that the 13th Amendment did not actually do away with slavery. What it did is it gave the appearance of doing away with slavery, but because the public was not educated, then everyone was volunteering. So it effectively, um, it was a continuation of slavery under a new name. Under a new name, uh -huh. yes, exactly. Do you, do you agree with that? Yes, it did away with, it, the 13th Amendment did away with involuntary slavery, and you'll see that in my handout. But it didn't do away with voluntary slavery, which is what we all have participated in. Yes? Uh, uh, you had said that. Wait, uh, wait for the mic, please. Sorry. You had asked where the United States Incorporated was, but you didn't answer it. You never uh, heard your answer. Oh, you never, you never heard it? Okay. I, I, I had hoped not to skip over that. The, the place that the United States citizen lives or is, has has allegiance to is 
the 10 square miles of Washington, D.C. Now let me explain this, Wendy, okay? This, I can explain it very simply. If you were to go to France tomorrow and work, do you still have to pay the IRS? Probably. Yes. 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 I mean, you worked overseas, didn't you? Did you pay the IRS? Yes. Why? You weren't on the land mass. You weren't on any of the 50 states. But you were in involuntary slavery. You were in involuntary slavery. It's subject to the jurisdiction of the 10 square miles, which is everywhere. Okay. Okay, which is which is a point that you're not really making clear. Okay. It's it's not just the ten square miles. It's all the military uh, facilities, yes. territories, territories. Uh, but but the other thing, um, and I'm not maybe saying this the right way, is unless you are putting your foot on the land, mm -hmm. that you very well could be above the land in. The and the overlay. It's called an overlay. overlay. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Anybody want to answer that question? Okay. Okay. I can answer it very quickly. Okay. There's several things that you do for the overlay. I didn't want to get into it tonight about the overlay, but what it is is that when you use the abbreviation TX, that belongs to the overlay. The, that belongs to the overlay. That belongs to the 10 square miles. Isn't it the capital TX? The capital TX. If you use the capital T and a lower X. Then that's not, oh. right? Or TEX, I think is the correct. Yeah. Oh. Go, go ahead, uh, Wendy. Oh, okay. Um, with regard to capitalization on our documents per se, ID and, and what have you, that's <coughs> what happens uh, to all my citizens, whether they're citizens or not. Yes, and the reason why they do is because once once a lawful inhabitant who's not matriculated into the system gets an ID, then he is subject to the jurisdiction. Once he gets a green card, once he does anything that where the state gives him permission, then he's no longer a free inhabitant of the land. Even just for a driver's license. Even just for a driver's license. Uh -huh. yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, take mm -hmm. up residence. Yes. Mm -hmm. Even though you have not sworn allegiance Correct. to the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. You better watch yourself. <laughs> 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 oh, wait, Wendy, did you have a question? Oh, oh okay. Oh, okay. Um, what can you explain the business of putting a star on the. Uh, on the license? Okay, the star on the license means that you have not complied yet with um, the Real ID Act. And so they're starting to do that. I haven't seen it yet, but I, I've heard about it. Oh, no. Everybody, everybody has it now? Okay. Yeah, not everybody, but it's in effect. You renewed the last couple of years. Like about a year old. Yep. In, yep. Yep. in October. It's, you know, it's October. Yep. Okay. 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 So what, what, what is it meant to achieve? Um, I think it's probably fear mongering. You know. Yeah. Well, it could be fear mongering, but the point is that that's what you're going to need to show to get on a plane. Yes, well, right. actually, though, if you're an inhabitant of the land, you can use your passport. All passports. You can create your own passport. And there's something that I touched on in here, but one thing you can do with your passport application is to rebut the presumption that you are a U.S. citizen in your passport and you get a special passport that says you're an American. And it only says it in your application. It doesn't say you're a citizen on the passport. Hmm. My question wasn't really answered. My question okay. really is, okay, if you're a corporation, like you can say, uh, this is the house where this corporation lives, like where I live, but it's like, I live there, Paul lives there, but who is the corporation is what I'm asking, because you can say, this is the corporation identity, it's in Washington, it probably changes they don't disclose who the owner is there are a lot of theories about who the owner is um, and you can get into a lot of conspiracy theories about who the owner is but it doesn't really matter who you have a contract with like I said when you get a credit card do you know who owns Visa no it doesn't matter 
You're still obligated if the force of law is behind it. I think it's a good time now if you wish to explain what a legal person is. Okay. All right. Let me see if I can put this together. You want to just explain a legal person? Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. There are two entities. There's a lawful human being in the Constitution, and there's a legal creation. Okay? And what that legal creation is, is, is it isn't a person because a corporation can't be a person. A corporation is a business, right? It's a false entity. It's a false entity. Okay, so by our driver's license, different things, we've, we've allowed a false entity that we don't know about be our, repre our authorized representative. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> So that's your persona? That's your persona. It's not really you. It's right. just your straw man. It's a, I mean, you can talk all, you do two hours on that. So, yeah. Citizens of the United States need to, need to send the corporation for people. And everybody's upset about that. Yes, because a pe people is a person, and a person has no rights, according to Black's Law Dictionary of the Supreme Court. But Citizens United was correct. Let me have a in a in a uh, lopsided way. Citizens United was correct because uh, a corporation could be a person because persons aren't alive anyway. Yeah, persons aren't alive anyway. So persons have no rights. It's amazing, isn't it? Well, I I couldn't believe I got to be the age I was. I didn't know this stuff. It's not like they were telling you all the way. No, they weren't telling you. Okay. I don't know how this works, so like, okay, there's one right there. As it relates to the territories, okay. um, they can't vote in elections if, you, if you're born in Puerto Rico and what have you. You have citizenship, but you can't vote there. But once you hit the mainland, you can. You can. Yes. Uh -huh. okay. And so, um, when is there? How do they um, function here? They, because they're totally out of control of, of Congress. What happens to them? No, the word the word is called obfuscation, mm -hmm. and what they do is okay. Everybody's clear that the territories don't vote and don't have rights, right? Unless That's they come here, then they, they come here. Right. They put their foot on the soil. There's a merger of the two. I think that's page 18 in my, my yes. thing. Okay. So there's a merger of the two, but we've contractually admitted that we are citizens. Therefore, our vote has no force, it has no standing. Even though they give us lip service and they let us register, the minute we tell them that we're a citizen, it's a, it has no effect. Yeah, but I'm, what I'm saying is that even in a place like, um, you know, the territories where you have citizenship but no voting rights until you step onto the mainland, right? Right. There's something, you know, how are those individual citizens defined based on the criteria that because you use tonight, given the fact they live in two worlds? But no, they're living in the same world. But when they step on the mainland, uh -huh. their world changes, as, regardless of whether it's a vote or what happens. Uh -huh. it's red, it's uh -huh. Okay. The point is, what they get here when they step on the mainland as a citizen, they do not get when they're in Puerto Rico. Okay. As a territory, but citizen. Okay. So how do you explain that? I, I explained it that, that, that the U.S. citizen on the land gets a piece of paper. And that piece of paper says, I am a U.S. citizen. They don't need piece of paper. They're already U.S. citizens. No, you're, not, you're, you're only a U.S. citizen by your declaration. And you they're read coming in from Puerto Rico. They don't need the declaration. No. They they do, they, when they were born on Puerto Rico, they were born in a territory, meaning that they don't have any, any rights or any standing. They're federal citizens. They're federal district. They're they federal a U.S. Citizens. They do, but their U.S. passport is just like mine. My U.S. passport says I'm not a citizen. No, I understand, but the point is that to come from Puerto Rico to here, mm -hmm. you shouldn't require even a passport for entry. No, 
they don't, they're, they're not part of it. What I'm saying is that here we have the state and the territory. Citizenship applies in those scenarios. Uh -huh. But as soon as they put, uh, put on a different piece of terra firma, their, their um, rights enhance or whatever. Yeah. They're, they're, in, in reality, their rights are not enhanced. Well, I understand yeah. your view on that. Yeah. I'm just saying yeah. that voting occurs on the mainland or the continuum of states and Alaska. Yes. Right. Right. Not in the territories. Correct. Uh -huh. right. Correct. However, so what is their standing if they have citizenship in those places? but it denies some of the rights of what you call us as being okay. non-rights. I, I, I took that out of my presentation because it was too hard <laughs> to grasp, but the, there are two words. They're standing and status, okay? The U.S. citizen has no standing, and the U.S. citizen has no standing status. He has neither. Yeah, but the territories are not in the state. That's right. They're not part of the Either in is Washington, D.C. Yes, so therefore, the person sitting in Puerto Rico is in a little different circumstance. Since it's they're not part of the United States, they are territory. One is hidden and one is not, but they're the same status. The U.S. citizen has the same status as a Puerto Rican. That's, that's everything that I explained in a nutshell. And I think it's page 18. It's merged. Okay. Yeah. And would you say that we have been lied to all our lives? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I wouldn't say it was lied. I would say that it was hidden. And ignorance of the law is no excuse. In your estimate, if you would, how many people do you think who have been so-called elected into Washington, D.C., know a tinker's damn about all of this. Um, I think very few people know. I think Obama probably knew. Oh, yes. Um, yes. But I don't think, um, personally, now we get into arguing about it, but personally I don't think Trump knows. I don't think he knows. I think Trump is honorable. I think if he knew, he'd hit the ceiling. But I don't think he knows. I think he's doing what they tell him to do. What would happen if Max be tried to refute any of this? Would we end up in jail? Um, well, actually, the first thing I would say is that if you wanted to do any of these revocation of election processes, <clears throat> I would um, study for about a year or two. And then, and I don't mean just like once in a while, I mean like two or three hours a day. <laughs> and then I would, um, there's a lot of information online, start reading the Constitution, start reading, um, case law, just different things, get your head around it. Um, basically, Congress has provided for a way out. It's a lawful and legal way to, to leave the system so that you're not going out there and protesting abortion and then going back to work and paying for it through your, through your federal taxes. So if you don't want to participate anymore, there's certain things that you can do. Now, I'm not giving you any tax advice. I'm not saying vote, don't vote. I'm just saying there are ways to resign. Because you can't, this is a system that is a private corporation. You don't go to Walmart and tell them what to do. It's no different than the United States Inc. It's a corporation. And if you work for Walmart, you have certain privileges. But there's certain things you can't do. So. Just a quick clarification. You said that Washington, D.C. was a democracy. What did you mean by that? Are they a true democracy? Yes. Okay, what I, what I meant by that is that Washington, D.C. is represented by um, its constituents, right? And But they're not you and me. They're, they're, they're the owners of Washington, D.C. It has nothing to do with us. So that's not a democracy, that's it's not a democracy. No. Well, the thing about it is it's a democracy between the shareholders who have standing and status. Right. Uh, it's only a true democracy if everybody in that thing has equal vote. Uh, mm, not really, but... I think we could add to that that there are several different definitions in the English language of words. 
Okay, mm -hmm. that's and good. I think what you're dealing with is you're talking about one and thinking about another. Um, in my understanding of democracy is it's the tyranny of the 51%. Correct. have something different to say on that? Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. So, okay, now we are supposed to be purportedly a republic with democratic process. Is that a correct statement? Yes. No. Okay. The United States, Inc. is not. I, I didn't say I said we. We. Now, we the people, we are supposed to be, have certain processes, yes. On the, on the republic side, yes. I read a long time ago, and I wonder if you have any knowledge on this point, that the original Constitution, the title of it was Constitution. For. 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 Yes. for. Uh -huh. Not of. Uh -huh. The people right. wrote the Constitution to create and control their government. The government didn't write the Constitution to control us. Correct. Right. And, and that that's changed that. Uh -huh. They did a lot of subtle language changes. Yes. And I didn't use it tonight because it just would be too confusing, but um, that is correct. Okay. Well, during the rebuttal, I'm going to get up and I'm going to disagree with what you're saying. Okay. But I just want to make it clear that I'm disagreeing from a level of someone who's already educated themselves. It's not, if someone here has an idea that they just don't think this is all real, uh, what I'm affirming is this is very real, what you're saying. And you have law, you have documents that back up everything you've alleged this evening, correct? Correct. <clears throat> Do you believe in federal government? Well, I believe that it's real. Yeah. Do you personally believe there's value to having a federal government versus state government? Sure. State government? Yes, but let's not call it rights. Let's call it privileges, duties. Whatever. Yeah. Sure, if you want to be in that. It's personally, I prefer not to have any duties, and I don't really want the privileges of Social Security, voting, and going to war and, and paying for abortions and whatever. I don't want those obligations and privileges. So I'm not mad about it. I'm just resigned from it. I've just revocated my election not to participate in that. Now, everybody in this room can do it if they want to because that's what the 14th Amendment is about. It's about voluntarily contracting with the federal government because involuntary servitude to the federal government was done away with with the 13th Amendment. Okay, what I'm asking though is, so it sounds like you're not really into, or into the federal government, content, you know, having impact on our lives. Personally. No, the federal government does have impact on many people's lives. Of course it does. I prefer, I prefer not to go to public school. I prefer not to send my children to public school. I prefer to keep all my money. I prefer to have gold and not have to be the, the authorized representative when I go to the bank. I prefer a lot of things. But you don't have to. Everybody has a choice, and that's the beauty of the 14th Amendment. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's a very good amendment. I didn't say it. I said there, the remedy is in the 14th Amendment. So let me make that clear before we end. The remedy for any problem that you have is in the 14th Amendment because you can opt out. And we have free will. And you can if opt we, in. And you can opt in. If you want benefits and privileges, if you want Obamacare and all those things, you can get it. And that's the beauty of the 14th Amendment. Because the 13th Amendment said nobody can force you to get it. To be a slave. To be a slave. Uh, I have more of a comment. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, I love this country. Uh-huh. Uh, and I'm just, just briefly, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my history. Okay. Probably about 150 years ago, I don't know how long ago, but my grandmother from Spain, who was a Spaniard, uh, Messianic Jew, Jew okay. happened to come to the United States because her nephew, her son, her relative was a judge somewhere here in Texas. Okay. And she came to visit from Spain, and she ended up having my grandfather. So my grandfather was born in the United States, went back to, to Spain. He never came back. He never visited uh, uh, 
Again. He never visited. Uh, yeah, he, yeah, he was just, you know, he was a Spanish American citizen. His uh, son, who is my father, uh, you know, he grew up in, in Spain and he ended up working for an American company in Spain. Okay. Somehow they found out that he, his father was an American citizen and he said that they called him, they had an Ameri American steel company in, in Pittsburgh. And they had companies here in the United States and I think in, in Mexico and Colombia. And it was like a mining company, a coal mine. And they called him and they said, your, fa your father is an American citizen, you speak English and we want to send you to America. What is your question? Oh, it's my question. Yeah. yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So he is an American citizen. He okay. was an American citizen. What year? Uh, I think he became an American citizen in 1957, 58. Okay. And because of him, then I'm here. Okay. But I was not even born here because he was in a different country. Yeah. And I was um, uh, for five kids. Uh, two of us were born in Mexico, the rest were born in the United States. And all I can say, you know, we used to ask my father, so where are we? My mom was born in Italy, uh -huh. later becoming an American citizen. Okay. And I think all this article is wonderful, and uh, some of them I knew about it, some of them I'm a school teacher. I do believe in public education, uh -huh. because I've been mean, the number one uh, school in the United States. And I think it's wonderful. I believe in the 14th Amendment, a life of freedom. Uh, but She's I think it, What's your question? I'm going to say, no, I said I had a comment. Oh, so, comment. I'm sorry, I'm pleased. That's coming later. That's okay. Okay. Q&A Well, let me just finish my Okay. Yeah. It's clear. Go ahead. So, I think that the bottom line, and it all this is interesting, but to me and my my family used to say, we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Well, you can't be both. Yeah. You can't be both. Well, I am. I am, and I love health, and I love the freedom. Yeah. You have allegiance to one or to the other. Well, I, yeah. I, I, I am. You're a citizen of something that doesn't make sense. Yeah. It's like, 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 we got five minutes, whatever you want to say, either for or against what the speaker had to say, now is your chance. Well, this is kind of like, uh, um, you know, you see the Olympic diving uh, con contests. This is not an undertaking. Uh, uh, you know, you're, you're not you're not going to go out there and do a belly flopper and uh, uh, be serving yourself. Uh, this is uh, a call to be educated on this. But uh, see, I'm I'm just completely wishy-washy on this whole thing. I mean, I can lean on one foot and I can be a Fourteenth Amendment citizen. I can lean on the other foot and I'm a state state citizen. But I mean, I'm of the kingdom of heaven, so. Um, and, and the point I'm trying to make is that um, it's kind of like dealing with the pirates of the Caribbean. There is so much fraud, there's so much, uh, they call it fraud, duress, and coercion. And uh, I actually, I've uh, signed my driver's license with uh, TDC, which is Threat, Duress, and Coercion. Um, it used to work better on the old systems. The new ones just have these thick lines and you can't really tell it's a TDC anymore. And sometimes they cut it off. They'll cut off the, the end there. So uh, I'm not saying they know what I'm doing, but in my own way I'm giving notice that I'm submitting, but I'm really not submitting because it's under threat, duress, and coercion. And in Black's Law Dictionary, I don't remember if it's third edition or wherever, but uh, sixth edition, um, what, what, whichever, it, it's an old maxim of law that where whatever fraud touches, whatever fraud touches is null and void. They say that fraud vitiates the most solemn contract. Now, 
you know, I, I, I can kind of move in and out of contract, I feel. Uh, but see, it's, it's almost like, okay, where is my remedy? If I have a remedy as a 14th Amendment U.S. citizen, I'm sorry, I'm going to go after that remedy as a 14th Amendment U.S. citizen. If I have a remedy, if I have a remedy as, as a uh, sovereign state citizen, I'm going to, I'm going to take that remedy there. It's, it, it becomes a matter of my self-interest in the situation at hand because this is simply, I, I mean, th this is literally like a, a tangled web spread over the landscape that will entrap you so easily. And I know people who've been in this for years. They're in and out of jail. Um, I, I actually developed a term uh, for this, and you, you can laugh because it's kind of funny, but it's kind of sad, but it's kind of funny. I call them legal crash test dummies. I'm there videotaping these things. These people are actually in court trying these things. They're trying to assert their, their sovereignty. They're trying to seek their remedy. They're trying to do all these things. Well, see, that's that you end up in court sometimes, whether you intended to be there or not. And, and this is the thing is, you know, I've, I've known people who filed papers for years and yet they still lose their homes, they still end up in court. And then what do you do when you're in court? Well, some of these folks, you know, that I call, they say that they hit the wall as hard as they can. They, you know, they, they've got the best, best lawful stuff on their side of it. And, you know, they've refuted all this. They filed all the correct forms. And the judges are corrupt. And so it, it's not, over years I, I decided that there was no secret Dick Tracy decoder key or, or you know, thing that's going to unlock the system. We have a system of profound corruption. Mm -hmm. You're on your own, folks. You know what? We all should study what he was presented here this evening. It's very real. It's very real. The, uh, the thing of it is, is who has time? I mean, I used to travel around the country. I'd have $50,000, $60,000 worth of video gear. You better have your papers in order. <coughs> or if you're going to do this, if you're going to pursue these things in this manner, I know a lot of people who divested themselves. They didn't have any personal property. They didn't have, because you're, you're going to lose it. You're going to lose that car that you are operating your uh, private uh, vehicle that you're you're going to lose, you know, these things happen. So, um, and, and this is not a completely negative statement. I'm just, I'm just saying, you know, the, the road is a pretty rocky road. It can be a very rocky road. And I champion everyone who's had successes. Um, you know, it's just like with Joe Bannister. Um, I've known Joe Bannister for years. You can say you beat the IRS, but you really haven't beat the IRS until they quit coming back around and coming after you. It's, it's just like, you know, it's so. And then with, with responding to the idea of democracy, is uh, a pure democracy is mob rule. The reason we have a republic here is the idea of reserved rights, rights given by God. Granted by God, the government can't touch. That's the theory. Every time, your rights are never as in peril as when legislation is in session. Amen. Okay. So, I mean, they're always trying to, to divest us of our rights. If you are not a belligerent claimant of your rights, it's like Michael Brown said, the only rights you really have are those you can defend in court. Sorry about that. But if you can't defend your rights in a court of law, you don't really have them. Well, I found your, your presentation interesting, but uh, my experience, uh, I, I've studied political science and I have two degrees in that area. It don't mean I know everything. And I didn't just live by the book that they issued because I always challenged them a person. One of the things I agree with 
the 12 miles of District of Columbia is a different thing. Uh, that's the seat of the national government. And uh, they can elect representatives that can, that can really vote. They have someone that goes symbolic for the Senate. And it's been a movement uh, to try to pass a constitutional amendment to do away with that. And the same thing in you know, other territories that the government owns, the military, they're dominant there. Uh, maybe I'm naive, but <laughs> I think when I vote, uh, you know, they count the votes. Many times, the person I vote for get elected. And, and like the Republican form of government is where we elect our representatives. We don't represent ourselves. And, and I know, and as I've alluded to a number of times here, that currently, most governments have sold out to, to corporations. And when they vote, they really don't vote for the average person. But the Constitution does give the citizen the leverage to do something about that if we'll get up and do something about it. But most of us complain and, and the situation gets progressively worse. So I seem to think, based on my studies, that we do have some rights as citizens. Um, and, uh, and I know contracts are things that's enforceable and, and, and because it has what both parties do in a contract and then you have to live. If you don't, you violate that, there, there are consequences. Um, I know we got off in the gold standard and we don't do that. It's good we're not on it because there's not enough, we don't have enough gold to pay our debt. So we, we are, that's, that's something I know. And I, <clears throat> but they're trying to get people to, you could buy gold and as an investment. <clears throat> you didn't really, you know, you, you, you had to pay for the gold and you get investment. And I had friends that tried to do it and I wish I had done it in the early days because it was, you know, it wasn't nearly where it is right now and I could have made a killing, but I didn't do that. Um, so I tend to think we do have some rights. I think when we vote, it, it counts. I think if you want to back not register, you don't have to register. You don't have to vote. You don't have to register. You nobody's forcing you to register, and nobody's forcing you to vote. Um, so, and I know that Congress passed laws, and this, these Article Six of the Constitution say the Constitution and laws enacted by Congress are supreme law of the land, and no state law or city ordinance can see, go beyond that. I know that's there, and that's what I call the national government. But we do have our representatives, and I think if we were a little bit more wise and not so polarized, we could get a better product than we're getting right now. But uh, so I have some concerns about it because I too believe in public education. Uh, our children went to public schools, they went to a public college. Um, so, and I think public education made a tremendous impact. And the greatest impact were the veterans that came back that wasn't messed up after World War II. Under the GI Bill, we had, it was, most of the, the thing was they could do better going to college. Getting 150 bucks a month, tuitions paid, books bought. So they went to college. And, and that's what created the dynamic middle class that we had, that we're losing right now. So I think the government has done some good things, and I've been to a few countries in the world, and even though I criticize our government, but I'm criticizing them because we could do so much better. We'd be much, so much better, and we're not doing it. So that's my take on that. I just want to validate what Eve said about uh, the federal territories and that federal government. If you read Title 26 tax law, um, it has some extremely screwy definitions of United States in there. Uh, and in my talk that I gave in September in this place here, um, you can go online and look it up. And one of the one of the one of the slides shows 
a law that says the United States has something to do with a businessman in Puerto Rico when it goes on for like a whole paragraph. Um, you would think United States would be pretty simple to define, but when you go to Title, title 26, it gets really screwy. Um, but as a matter of fact, it says uh, the United States is Washington, D.C., and a state is Washington, D.C. So when it talks about United States, it's meaning Washington, D.C. However, if you use that in your tax filings, that's a frivolous position, even though that's what the law says. Uh, so it's really screwy. Uh, when you read Title 26, you cannot find a common sense definition of almost anything that it defines in there. It's always some screwy definition that refers to federal territory when it refers to United States. And there is no law that requires you to pay income tax. I know people here will disagree, but I have two, dis two current disputes with the IRS and I challenge them to specify or cite a law that requires me to pay income tax and they could not do it. And they've had since March 15th of last year on one dispute and they haven't, they can't even quote the law. I asked them to quote the law as it applies to me and they can't do it. They can't even quote the law. Uh, so what he was saying about the federal jurisdiction is correct. And if you read the law, you'll find out for yourself. I'm so liberal. I think when you look at it, I mean, I'm just amazed at the knowledge that you have gained and the research that you have done. <clears throat> when you look at it, all of the system that we are controlled by has been put together by some brilliant people. Not good people, but brilliant people. And when you look at it, you see that there's a lot of parallel, I think, in the mindset of Satanism. Because, and I'll tell you this, and I've mentioned this before, my, my nephew went to St. Andrew's College in Fife, Scotland, and he began to hobnob with the children of some of the elite families around the world. A lot of them go to that college, and he learned that all those families, virtually all of them, the ones we think are so respectable, hold themselves out as being loyal Anglican or loyal Catholic or whatever it is that fits in. That's their sheep's clothing that fervently and secretly they are Satanists and they practice Satanism. And one of the major things about Satanism is this firm belief. Through the death of an individual, another can extract the departing life force, absorb it, and strengthen and lengthen their own lives. And through the deaths of millions, a few may attain physical immortality. Now, we don't have to believe that, but they firmly believe it and hence we have wars, famines, and pestilences. And I had a guy 27 years, a friend in the CIA, tell me that all wars, famines, and pestilences are planned events. They're not acts of nature. They're not stupidity and diplomacy to make us, make us think that. They're brilliance to make us think it's stupid. It's planned. The people who put all of this together, I, I don't know who they are. You know, like you mentioned several terms. There is some if you want to call this collection an entity up there that uh, has been ruling this planet for probably as long as we've been here. And I think the most powerful thing that we have is prayer. Because in our consciousness, we then align with the presence of one infinite good. And if you've ever read the book, The Secret, or watched the DVD, what you hold in your consciousness is what you project as your future. You create your own future by either not thinking and just letting it all come in the back door and believing it, or what you use to change the future. One perfect example is 
the guy in that book uh, who was, when he was, I think, a teenager on the East Coast growing up, he just started obsessing, I want a beautiful house someday. And then in a magazine, he found a full-page picture of a beautiful house, and he cut it out and pinned it on his wall, and he looked at it, you know, for years. And then he grew up, and he moved to California, and he got married. They had a kid, and then they decided to buy a house, so they bought a house, and they were moving into the house. And their little boy started helping unpack boxes, and he found that picture, and he brought it and said, Daddy, what is this? The very street address they were moving into at the moment. That is how much he projected his future. Another example, uh, there was, I heard this on the news, driving in my car in the 60s. A German paratrooper went out of an airplane at 3,500 feet over Rhein-Main Air Force Base for a practice jump. His chute didn't open, he landed smack dab in the middle of the concrete runway. Well, the so-called laws of physics and physiology say they just, you know, take a, a broom and, yeah, I mean, he's gone. That evening, when he was being interviewed by these astonished reporters, sitting upright in his bed with his one broken leg and a bunch of bruises and no other internal or external injuries, they said, how in the world did we survive that fall? And he said, well, our instructor taught us how to land right. And he taught us if we did land right, we could survive any fall. I knew how to land right, I knew I was going to land right, and I knew I was going to survive. And that was so strong with all of his emotional energy behind it that he changed the so-called laws of physics and physiology. The most important movie ever made to me is The Matrix, the first version of it. Because we are living in a matrix. Amen. And I had one that I would have to call a near-death experience. And when I came back here, I realized I was doing what we all do, falling asleep back into this unreal dream of physical experience. If we will pray which means getting your left brain highly educated thinking mechanism the hell out of the way so that you can listen and be silent, then you can hear the presence of the kingdom that comes in that still small voice. And I can't think of anything more important to me that I would say we need to do if we love humanity and we love this country because the people who control it, they are so deceptive that People highly educated believe them. I went to the philosophers meeting the other night. Your invitation, okay. It's your invitation and these people, they have more PhDs than they can bring in on a wagon. And they, there are a lot of college professors and authors and so forth and I sat down at a table. Well, do you believe in aliens? The little checklist. Do you believe we landed on the moon and so forth? And I realized, man, they're just, you know, they're evaluating me. If you do not believe what they are taught, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. They are not open to challenges. They are, I mean, that's the opposite. You know, I've talked about extreme liberalism being emotional. They are so left brain that they can't get out of their right. But everything is totally different from materialism. now on the rebutters here is uh, I believe you should pay every tax you owe. Some of us don't owe a whole lot. If you go to a really good CPA, you can find how much you don't owe. And um, that's a lot safer than taking on an IRS with code written by the devil. Actually, that's kind of funny because they tried to computerize the IRX IRS tax code. I don't it really seem it. like they tried as I, like they spent a billion dollars on it was some some incredible amount. And they failed. Why did they fail? They can't even quote it. Because it's gobbledygook. It it has and you were talking about Title Twenty Six. I actually uh, was uh, talking with a tax researcher by the name of Clark, I don't remember his first name, but uh, Dave Clark, he was like the Dave Clark guy, you know. Um, he, uh, he identified that some of the 
coding in Title 26 actually refers over to Title 27, the BATF uh, oh, yeah. uh, stuff. And, and you get in this whole conversation about taxable activities and, um, you know, were you engaged in uh, some taxable activity? What's, what's your, uh, your in it? oh, I, I got a form from the IRS asking me to um, please uh, fill in the blanks and they wanted my taxpayer indemnification number. And I went to the IRS guy, I said, don't you mean taxpayer identification number? I mean, is, isn't this a, like an error here on your form? I mean, indemnification number? What is indemnification? Oh, that's just an error. Oh, it's okay for you guys to have errors. If I have an error, that's, ooh, that's a really bad deal. Now, the thing about evil is, I've, I've really, I've been subject to a lot of different people researching into these areas, and one of the things you find is you can make the error of presuming that evil is actually refined and rational and all that and so forth, and it's, it, it may be a very uh, complicated and dangerous, but it's, it's really just a bunch of liars following the father of lies. And uh, it's, it does fall apart when you start examining it closely. It's not, uh, and, and one of the big issues I have is, is that uh, evil people will adopt and uh, subvert symbols and symbolism. And I think sometimes we need to uh, redeem symbols that really belong to the uh, light side of things and not allow this darkening of uh, the symbolism. Thanks. there's any problem with the tax code. It's very clear to the people who wrote it. Is it? Yeah, all the corporations. You don't think the congressmen do. I don't think it's clear to them <laughs> So, I don't, of course it's not. But this is the price they pay, okay? And it's written for the benefit of those who are going to benefit the most. Um, that said, I too believe that you have to pay taxes. Okay, it's a little lopsided right now, and that needs to be corrected. Um, but all, all the prayers in the world, I don't think, at this point in our country, and history in our country, is going to imbue the integrity and scruples that it's going to take from our Republican electorate in Washington, okay, who are just giving it over all, uh, you know, I don't even know how to, I, I don't know why they're not embarrassed, but apparently they're not. Maybe they go home and cry to their wives. But uh, the point is that until that changes, and that they're, they're saying, you know, that um, no black is white or vice versa, okay, and that we're going to follow a demagogue where we, wherever he may lead us because it's profitable for us, then no, it's not going to change. I believe in federal government. I believe in states' rights. But I also believe that federal law does trump state rights. And um, public education, uh, all of the, and even health care, whether it's a public option or what have you, can be your choice. But there needs to be a reasonable public option of it. Uh, not a business profitability uh, program, which is what's in effect nowadays. I do not um, object for paying taxes for anything that is public policy in service of the public good. And when I say public good, I mean all the citizens of this country. And I do oppose legislation that is rolling back regulations that in, you know, uh, that defy other laws that were put in place for the public good and health and safety and what have you. 
And this is all happening in front of us. And no one's doing anything about it. And again, I would absolutely reference all of you who can catch it, because I do believe that it is very, very telling in our time. Um, on PBS, there's a program called Dictator's Playbook, and it references various dictators. Most of them, they're in the 20th century, and it, it, it doesn't change, you know, it, to, to um, bring about fear, cultivate personality, a cult of personality. Uh, all of this is happening right now in this country, okay? So it's a very easy slide when you project all of this nonsense about nationalism and what have you, um, and, and people, it's wrong. We are, yes, citizens of the United States, but we are also citizens of the world. And, and for all the, the talk of faith and prayer, we as citizens of this world, as well as many other countries, we're, we're not Robinson Crusoe here, but we sit back and we watch untold terror be unleashed throughout the world, and it's just a blink on a newscast, or it might pop up in your Google News, or what have you, I don't know, I don't, don't use the phone to get my information, but, uh, you know, we are really at a turning point. And as far as the debt is concerned, um, yeah, we, we have an obligation to pay that, but why haven't we well before today questioned what the hell the money is being spent on in the first bloody place? And we do have power of vote, okay? And I really hope that everyone will vote us out of the madness that we have existed in, not only the past three years, but since 2010. And I hope that that vote will ensure that hatred and, and uh, racism and uh, xenophobia and all of the other nonsense that makes us an incredibly uncivilized society, you know, will return to normal. And, and, and be decent citizens, because I consider myself a decent person, and I consider the majority of our Americans to be decent, honest, and good people. But the display that's out there now, no, no way. And the 14th Amendment is a great amendment, and it has been um, the basis for mo most civil rights that we get to enjoy today. Okay? Thank you. Hmm. Well, Ian, that was an extremely uh, interesting talk. Um, coming from England, of course, I have a, you know, a different view of things. One, one aspect, of course, is we do not have a, a writ constitution. We've never had one. Therefore, we do not have um, a federal uh, area which houses the government. I mean, it doesn't exist. You see, so many of these problems that America sort of tied itself up in knots over, you know, don't you, you know, what, what really um, has gone on with this stuff, uh, with the Constitution and many other aspects is, um, America sort of got itself stuck in aspect actually, like two, actually, um, they copied the um, English system that existed 300 years ago, where the king had a cabinet and could appoint his ministers at the approval of Parliament. Well, of course, that's all done away with now. In fact, there is a cabinet, but it's in the House of Commons. It's run by the Prime Minister. And so we don't, we aren't, so listening to this, you see, it's just sort of, what is a person, what's a citizen, we don't know, you know, it doesn't exist in Britain. We're not, we're not confused like that. We might be confused over Brexit and so on, Although the, 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 the public, the average person has made it plain that they, don't, that they want to get out of Europe. And personally, since it's a neocon cabal in Europe, run mostly to the benefit of the Germans, of all people, you know, um, the party for the French. I mean, you know, so I'm glad to get out of it, actually, because it really, 
house of the, um, the British parliamentary system is, you know, a thousand years old, actually. It, it's, and it's moved, and it doesn't have these. If it, there are contradictions, it, it, it can change them. It's not bound by the, this, the Constitution and what the amendment says and doesn't say. No. We, we, and we don't think it's anything to do with God or anything else. But that it's not part of, not part of the, um, the, you know, the, the political debate when it, when it comes to that. You know, things we do cherish are things like the National Health Service, which has been under attack by this right-wing government we've had for the last 10 years. You know, the National Health Service is the most underfunded um, service in, in Europe. I mean, it's, it's been underfunded and underfunded to the point where they want to bring it down so it doesn't work anymore, and then they can privatize it. And so, and we've had all these public services been privatized, like probation services, and it's a disaster. And we see things that are like privatized prisons, privatized this. I mean, you know, the government has a you know a central function. In fact, I, I've spoken I've spoken about the economics of it. Actually, um, the good government can operate much more, and does, much more efficiently in terms of social provision than private uh, corporations do, in fact. And but, but because the belief here is, of course, oh, no, no, you know, the government is bad, um, corporations are just wonderful. Well, of course, in Europe now, of course, because the big tech companies like Amazon and Microsoft pay almost no tax because they can move their jurisdiction off to the Isle of Man or Jersey or some island where they claim their intellectual property resides. And of course, we, we said to Trump, well, we, and the French have as well, we might start taxing these corporations. Oh, no, well, we'll slap more tax on your cars, you see, from Germany. Really not. This stuff goes on. So going back to, I think all, um, you know, these, these are flawed institutions. America has, I think. And so it ties itself in knots. Um, so anyway, that's just a reflection on the state play. Someday it will occur that John doesn't get me out of my chair. <laughs> John. The American War for Independence was a British Civil War. We won, you lost. <laughs> we won individual rights. This goes all the way back to uh, uh, King Henry after his uh, brother had an unfortunate accident in a hunting incident. And to assure his people he was a good Christian king, he penned the Charter of Liberties of 1100, we had Magna Carta, Declaration of Our Growth, 1680s, I'm not even really, really educated about that, but major conflicts, people bled and died for the rights we have here. The 14th Amendment is a good example of the subterfuge we are living under, which is a reason we do not need to change a thing about the original document. Amen. John, I have always thought of you as a gentleman, and I like you and respect you, and you've done very well in life. But this, too, is an issue that I totally disagree with you on. The, we had that revolution to gain freedom for the people in this land, and this land was primitive at the time. It was largely forests and deserts and so forth. And under that freedom that the Constitution granted, we had a, 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 an idea called free enterprise. And even though Great Britain, at one point in its history, dominated practically the whole world in colonies from which it extracted all the goods it wanted for itself, the United States started an economy that became the most powerful nation on earth and remains there today under our Constitution. And we need to preserve that Constitution because thus far I think it is the best document made for human survival as a collective group. You know, you have to have some laws to keep everybody in line. 
as far as the IRS is confirmed, uh, concerned and the, the Federal Reserve, the IRS is the collection agency for the Federal Reserve and the debt of the United States is the Federal Reserve's debt. It's not our debt. Those notes we hold, they owe to us. And it's just, it's all flipped around and upside down. And if the people will wake up to this, we can go back to the constitutionally legal banking system that was the treasury and an asset-backed currency, which a lot of the world is beginning to move towards, thank goodness, and we can get rid of that Federal Reserve System and hopefully that entire banking system, of which it's a part worldwide, will collapse. Now, in the meantime, let's take an example. Our press vilified the living hell out of Gaddafi, and most people still think he was so awful. They did that because it was a cover-up for the truth. He went in there as a military dictator because they had two like the McCoys and the Hatfields, warring tribes that were just constantly destroying that nation. And he went in there with the military and he stopped the wars and he said, all right, we're forming a council like our Congress. You will come here and everybody, all of the tribes will decide what the outcome is going to be and there's going to be no more war. And then as that began to work out fine, he receded back and became an advisor rather than a dictator. And uh, he made it clear that nobody in his family would own a home until every citizen of the country owned a home. And he lived in a tent. And his father passed away without owning a home. He, did, he, he took that country as the poorest country in Africa and raised it to the most prosperous, free country in Africa. Women didn't have to wear burqas. Black Africans were equal to everybody. Women could drive and own their own cars could even start their own businesses or rise to any level in the business. Everybody was equal. But his fatal mistake was he was on a gold-backed dinar currency. And he was trying to get all the African Union countries to join in that, which would have meant prosperity for them. You know, Thomas Jefferson stated basically, if we ever let a private bank, bank get control of our currency, through inflation and deflation and the corporate structure that will grow up around it. Do we not see that today? They will steal all the property from our descendants and leave them homeless in the land that we have founded. And how many people have lost their homes and their properties because of this damn banking system? It's, it's evil. From the word go, it's evil and it needs to be eliminated. We need to go back to the Constitution, the amendment, 13th Amendment that established the Federal Reserve and the research has been done was never ratified by enough states to become a constitutional amendment. So that organization is still a criminal activity. And the purpose of the Federal Reserve was to collect and pay the interest on the, the money borrowed from the, from the Federal Reserve. That was the 13th. 16th. 16th, yes. Uh, by the... Um, but when our government needs money now, it borrows from this private bank. Whereas beforehand, the Treasury just issued the money it needed. And we need to go back to the Constitution. Uh, Otto Bismarck made a statement that uh, he felt that the experiment being carried on... Now, this was a brilliant diplomat who took all these warring tribes that are now Germany and allied them all together so that nobody could fight anybody without having to fight their friend and created one language and created modern Germany out of all of that chaos. And he stated that the, the, the experiment being carried out in the United States today may hold the hope of freedom for all mankind in the future. He really saw what we were after. And the Tsar of Russia during our Civil War put his, uh, his uh, ships out in the, his Navy out in the Atlantic Ocean. He told France and England, if you try to get your colonies back, you're at war with Russia because he saw what the value of it was. Of course, the banking system didn't like him. He ran all the bankers out, and a lot of them went to New York. It was known as Little Moscow for a while, and they concocted the Russian Revolution, murdered the Tsar and his family, took all the money out of his banks, and it goes on from there. You know, 
I think we understand, most of us, that the, the government has been captured by the corporations. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Those of us who have read the Communist Manifesto, that's what Marx predicted, and of course it's happened. Now, what have the corporations done? Well, the problem with the, the corporations that mostly write the laws is they have no concept of social uh, consciousness, actually. They don't really give a damn about the average ordinary person. And so what have they done? Well, yes, America um, gained its um, prominence because of the economics of science. I mean, it, it, it grew much larger than the, any country in Europe, and therefore the economy of scale meant that they, they had a much, much bigger market to, to sell to. And of course, therefore, you know, they, they were very competitive. The problem now is, of course, uh, China, with its 1.6 or so billion people, um, can outcompete out uh, America. Now, and of course, America, of course, is not paying its way in the world. We have a trade deficit of something like uh, half a billion a year, uh, half a trillion a year, actually. And who's done this? The, the American corporations. Now, I wrote a book some years ago called Sabotaging America, explain, explaining. Uh, uh, at the behest of one of my friends, how America is about the only country in the world with this wonderful capitalist system that self-sabotaged <laughs> its entire industrial base. Um, you know, so it, it's not been a wonderful great success. You know, the Second Amendment, where guns are plentiful. You know, look at you know one of the problems of Central America. Is because they they create drugs and, and that America didn't want, and of course they use American-made guns to fight each other and kill each other off en masse. So so now you talk about I mentioned the you know the dreadful British going around the world and exploiting colonies. They they actually granted most of their colonies. In fact, nearly all of their England, Australia, Canada, and so on and so forth. The independence. They didn't leave behind a trail of wreckage. Now, America has gone around the world mostly at the behest for corporate gain. I mean, look at the Iraq War. I mean, that was cooked up by Cheney. Uh, 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 you know, and he held a secret meeting once. Uh, uh, he, he was only uh, you know, with the W there in the office for about three or four months when they had this secret meeting and decided that they. Did, you know, now Gaddafi was, I mean, not, um, Bin Laden was nowhere near Iraq at the time. <laughs> the impact was in Afghanistan, as we know. But that was swept aside because apparently the weapons of mass destruction was terrible, so we had to go you know, and, and do something. Well, you know, look, America, is, with its corporations, has been no paragon of virtue, as far as I can see. And they've sold the country out, they've caused a rust belt. And it is, it is very serious. Now, when you talk about you know, public education now, you know, I'm a product of British public education. When I went to university, it was free. Now, because of the, you know, the pushback from the, from the right wing groups, it's no longer free. Housing was provided, and so on. And, health, and especially National Health Service, which is under attack. And so, I, I think the, the corporate influence is, is a, you, when you talk about Satan, if you, you know, look, it has no moral compass whatsoever. And it's actually sold this country out. And of course, because it's got to capture Congress, they've been complicit in selling the country out. And we all know that. Now, the most stupid thing I've ever seen done is corporations going to China to capture this lovely market. Oh yes, well, we'll these, especially these network sales people and bean counters, oh yes, we can give you our technology. <laughs> you couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I mean, it's, it's, it's insane to do that. And also willing Chinese students come in, probably teaching them, you know, of course the, the, the colleges now are on a you know, business basis. Oh yeah, we'll, we'll teach you the Chinese to the highest levels of technology and other lunacy. You know, I certainly wouldn't commit that. And so I, you know, look, yes, you, 
Yeah, you speak as if Britain doesn't have any freedom. No, a, a piece of paper doesn't. You know, but we have common law. I mean, much of American law, of course, is you know, based on British common law. Well, you know, look. No, I, you know, the old days, I, I could petition, you know, the House of the House of Lords actually, if I had it. And many countries have um, an ombudsman where you where you can, you know, petition the government. So there are many um, protections for the individual in lots of other countries. To say, you know, the Constitution is, remember, is the only vehicle that could do that is, you know, to my mind, ludicrous. It's not so. And of course, I, I think the average American has been shortchanged, actually, getting involved in all these wars. I mean, how many Americans have, di have died in all these ridiculous wars? Look, Vietnam, for example, a bloodbath that ended in defeat. What did it achieve? Who, why was it? Why are we fighting the Taliban? What quarrel do any of you have with the Taliban? Look, if, Afghan, if, Af if Afghanistan wants to be led by the Taliban, good luck to them. I don't care. You know. They might be repressive, they might be religious lunatics, but my goodness, there are many other lun religious lunatics around the world that we can also go to war with. I mean, they're all over the place. I mean, some are even in Utah. Anyway, five minutes is up. Yes. Anyway. Those guys have been up around two or three times. No more. Yeah, yeah. I've, 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 I've had my three strikes. I could get up again, but I've had my three strikes. So. Well, I've only had two. I think I'm the last one to say. I'm going to thank our speaker for doing a great job here tonight. It's a. Uh, it's a strange case we have in this country. Uh, whenever the economy goes bad, or seems to go bad, we always seem to have a rise of the lunatic fringe, if you ever noticed. And every, every imaginable thing happens that, that we have a discourse of government, everything, and people attack what is, the attacks come from every direction, and we end up in chaos. But if you look back in history a little bit, uh, Around 1933, 35, uh, we were in a huge depression. Uh, we, we, we put in government programs to, to stimulate the economy. All kinds of things were tried. And they, uh, they were all ready to fail until they passed the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938, which reduced the work week from 60 to 40 hours and the work day from 10 hours to 8 hours. And it was a federal law, not a state law. It only applied to interstate commerce. And big business and labor went hand in hand to each state legislature, and they, within five years, big business and labor lobbied each of the state legislatures, and they put on a shorter work day. And we ended up with a 40-hour work week. That's how we did it. And the rest of the world followed. It was part of why we were able to win World War II. When we got in the workforce, and it, it simulated the economy, it created a lot of jobs, it created a lot of things. My point is, is that Automation replaces people. Automation replaces people, and people are the only thing that pays taxes. And when automation replaces people, you don't have the jobs. Now we have a, today. We have a false economy. We have the grand. We've had the New Deal, the Fair Deal, the Square Deal, No Deal, Raw Deal. Now we have the Grand Illusion. We're told it can't be bad and feels great, you know. And what what's happened is a lot of the lower classes of uh, people that didn't have jobs have jobs, they're not making much. The middle class is not doing as well as it did even 10 years ago. They're worse off than they were because they're, they're, their pay isn't the same. People are hurting. And the economy, the economy is a false economy. We're, we're $20 trillion in debt. And why, are, why is the economy booming? Because we're so damn in debt. That's what's paying for it. And this can't go on. And we know that. And we have a president that says, oh, this is wonderful. but." You know, you can, you can say what you want, but this is, this is the problem. So what is the solution? The solution is to recognize that automation replaces people and people and machines don't pay taxes. That's part of the solution. And part of what we need is to shorten our work day. We need to go to a six hour day, a 30 hour work week, or a 20 hour work week. Because then we'd have, we'd have more people working paying taxes. We'd have less people now working grading taxes. The government would get a two-fold benefit increase tax revenue without raising taxes. There'd be less bills to pay for people who aren't working as they'd be working. 
in an economy that takes off, it would work. Uh, I, I know this for a fact. I negotiated a six hour day in the railroad industry years ago. It was quite by accident, but anyway, I won't go into that. But it, it can be done. And you won't gain two hours leisure time. You already lost it in traffic. You get it back. <laughs> and that's something else to think about. So we have a better life. But, but what, what, is, what are we doing? We're killing ourselves, working ourselves to death for no reason. And this is, this is why. Automation replaces people. And if you want to get a benefit of the automation, you have to shorten the work day. So that's part of it. The other part of it is corporations are leaving town and going where labor costs are cheaper. That's, that's what will happen if we shorten the work day. It'll leave all leave town on us and leave us here holding the bag. So we, we, have, we have laws that were passed years ago, antitrust laws. We need to look at that again. And, and when a corporation goes overseas, they need to pay a tariff to ship anything back here. If they produce it here, fine. If they don't want to produce it here, they can pay a tariff on it. That, that's, that's the only way we're going to level the playing field to keep corporations in our country. Because we have the best Congress money can buy. I mean, let's face it. And corporations are ruling the roost. And this can't go on. We have to, we, the American citizenry has to re rule the roost. And we have to elect our representatives. We have to get the money out of politics. And how are we going to do that? Well, there's a lot of things we can do. I, I just mentioned one of them. But there's, 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 there's things that, have to, that we haven't touched on and, and they have to be done. And we have to work together. And we have to be citizens together. And we have to create a, con a, create a country that works for all of us not just the tech people at the top, not just for the corporations. I hope I'm, I better shut up while I'm ahead. Anyway, thank you. And we get back to our speaker. You get, you get the last word. You get to comment on the comment that was made here and close this meeting. You get the last word. I'll make it really quick. Well, that's up to you. <laughs> you get the last word. All right, um, I think it really boils down to one thing, and that is the word allegiance. If we're a citizen, we have to ask ourselves, who are we alleging ourselves to? Just like a married couple, and we don't really use that, that term in marriage of allegiance, but we have alle alleged, alleged ourselves to our spouse. We can't go out and say, well, I'm going to have uh, a boyfriend down here and a girlfriend over here and over here I'm going to have this and that. I mean, we can do that, but then we don't have an allegiance, right? I mean, so the issue with this, with the citizen is that you can't be a citizen of the United Corporation of the United States located in Washington, D.C. and be a citizen of the, of the Republic where the republic is not based on partially common English common law. English common law was where the king was sovereign. American common law was based on the man is sovereign. Those two things are totally different. So what I was trying to say is that we're not we, we have a, the 14th Amendment gives us a choice. We can either participate, we can have our property taxed if we want to, at the nose of a gun if we don't pay, or they'll take it away from us. And that'll pay for our public school, and then we can have prayer in the flagpole. What good is that? So when we have prayer, when we say we have prayer, we need to pray for this country. I agree, I'm a Christian, I call myself a Christian. But if I pray, and then I make an allegiance to something that I don't agree with morally, like war, abortion, whatever it is, um, then I can pray all day. It's going to nullify my prayers. So my position is that you can continue funding the wars, funding the corruption that you call corruption, or you can make a decision to resign. And that sounds terrible to some people, but we're not talking about resigning to no government. We're talking about resigning to the established government, which was the government of the United States, of America, not the United States Corporation. 
And the United States corporation is not a government, as I explained in my talk. The United States corporation is a corporation posing as government. It is not government, it is a corporation with rules just like Walmart. So if you want to participate and work for Walmart, then go ahead. And they'll give you lots of benefits, they'll give you a retirement, they'll give you pay at the end of the day, they'll give you whatever you want. But as John said, he made a couple of statements, he said that it's, it's a corrupt system. No, the corporation of the United States located in Washington, D.C. is not corrupt. It's a corporation, and we contract with it. We can't say, I'm going to contract with it and pay for abortion and then say, oh, Jesus, forgive me for killing babies. The two don't met, meet, mix. So we're not talking about citizens of a government. We're talking about people who have made an allegiance to a corporation called the, called the United States of Washington, D.C. Then another thing that was said is that... Um, People say that they want to be citizens of the state and of the 50 states of the United States of America, or and they want to be 50 states of the corporation. It's an impossibility. It's an absolute impossibility. And uh, as John pointed out, he said that he'd seen people go to have their cars taken. Well, a corporation cannot take a car that is in a private trust. A corporation cannot take a house that's in a private trust. But a corporation can take your house if it's in your name, because your name is a registered entity. It's a false, it's a false name when we're talking about what the straw man is. The other thing about going to court, you do not have to enter into that jurisdiction. You can have your court cases dismissed for lack of jurisdiction. And you can look me up on the internet. I've been having had my cases dismissed four times for lack of jurisdiction and many traffic tickets dismissed for lack of jurisdiction. So you do not have to participate in that, in that pro program. So there are a lot of things that we can do instead of complain, we can just resign. And what's wrong with that? We don't have to complain anymore, but sometimes maybe we like to complain. So, and as far as the IRS is concerned, the IRS, Actually, I, in this, uh, in the flyers that I gave you, the IRS acknowledges because of Congress the revocation of election. It's provided for every citizen of the ten square miles of Washington D.C. the ability to revocate their first election to be a taxpayer. So that is in the IRS code. You don't have to walk in fear. It's there for you now. If you want to pay taxes. Go ahead. But if you don't, there's a provision in the 14th Amendment to not pay taxes. So that's, you know, the, those are my basic things is that don't, I would encourage people not to pull the prayer card and then contract with a foreign entity, the United States, that's not even actually chartered in this country. It's as, as he was saying, Title 26 is chartered in Puerto Rico. So I would encourage you to decide who you're, as the scripture says, decide the state who you're going to serve. If God is God, serve God. If man is God, serve man. So that's what I leave you all with, and that's it. <laughs>